Well, praise the wonderful name of the Lord, everybody. Praise God. I'm so glad to be in the house of God with you today. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Um, we have a lot that are going to be missing today. Uh, Brother J.R. and his family aren't feeling well, so they're not going to make it. Um, uh, Sister Denise and Brother Steve. So I guess Sister Denise was up all night, sick and not doing good. So let's pray for... Brother JR, let's pray for Sister Denise that the Lord will heal them and make them feel better. Amen? Amen. Um, any other prayer requests today? Spoken prayer requests? Anybody? Sister Martinez? My sister Bessie. And Yvette. Amen, Yvette. Be uh, Bessie? Bessie, yeah. yeah. How is Sister Yvette doing? Is she doing okay? Um, so, so, yeah. Amen. Healing. Uh, anybody else? Sister? Um, for Isaac, they got a house now that they just need my dogs. Oh, amen. Where did they move again? Sapporo, New Mexico. New Mexico. Anybody else? Yeah. And for Tim, yeah. we were in the emergency room Tuesday night and um, they can't do anything else for him there. He has to see the specialist to make sure it's just all bladder. I know it's just a little bit of pain. Yeah. But he's in so much pain right now. He's at work. And it's not his, his, uh, or no, whatever. Yeah. They did a, uh, cap scan to make sure it wasn't his colitis and it yeah. wasn't. So his gallbladder wasn't so enlarged that they wanted well, to take it out. Yeah, because the x ray and the ultrasound isn't going to attack it. It wasn't yeah. inflamed and there's no infections, but. You have to have a HIDA scan, okay. which highlights all your vital organs, right. and it'll show if it's functioning right. But I think that's what his problem is. So yeah. He's in a lot of pain. Okay, we'll be praying for Brother Tim, for sure. That gallbladder stuff, oh, and the appendix, nothing like it, man. Painful. Well, on top of his intestinal problem. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah. Man, that's scary. Um, also, I'd like the church to pray for my wife. We're going to go see the surgeon on Tuesday. Um, let's pray that we'll get some type of resolution on this and uh, that the Lord will give us clarity of thought and uh, we'll be able to figure out what to do and what to do, what, where to go next with her condition. Amen. Um, anybody else has a spoken request? Daniel? Um, for my friend Nathan, he got a cushion in his head. Oh, yeah? Yeah. For Nathan. Yep. Yeah. Healing. Amen. Anybody else? How about, uh, do you have a prayer request, brother? No? Yeah, it's like an auction. If you wiggle your nose, boom, I'm going to call on you. That's how that goes. Um, how about uh, unspoken prayer request? Something that's just between you and God alone. Amen. Repeat this first part after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you, God, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my might. Lord, I pray that You bless the prayers of this prayer, God. That You lift up our family and our friends, Lord. We're a needy people. We always are. We always will be, God. But I know that You are a God that can fill those needs. I pray uh, for Bessie, Lord God. I'm going to give her healing. Give her relief. Give her comfort. And for Yvette, Lord, I pray that You give her direction. Give her guidance. Give her wisdom. Give her a desire to pray. Give her a desire to talk to You and work through her problems, God, in Jesus' name. I pray uh, for my sister's son, Isaac, that you'd help him to find employment, help him to find a job that, that they'll be able to, to afford where they're living in New Mexico. And God, I pray a special prayer for my brother Tim right now as he's working through his pain and his suffering. Give him healing, give him comfort, Lord God Almighty, and I pray that you work this out in his favor in Jesus' name. God, I pray for my wife, Rachel, Lord, as we go see the surgeon, that you'd bless him and help him, Lord God Almighty, to have the to have the right understanding and the right ability. Help us to find conclusion, Lord, in Jesus' name. And for Daniel's friend, I pray uh, that you give Nathan healing and that you bless him and bring him through this time, that there be no bad effects from his concussion. Lord God Almighty, I pray that you bless those that are close to us. Help us to be an example and to be a light to them. Help us to lift them up and to have words of encouragement, Lord. God Almighty, I give to you the glory and the honor and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Also, I'd like the church to, to pray for um, Pastor Mark. Um, Pastor Mark, his wife passed away this last year, as you all know. 
um, and he, he, he went through his grieving process and he, and he found a girlfriend, she lives in New Mexico, um, they're, they're really getting serious, and so that's where he's usually at on the weekends, he's trying to spend time with her, and uh, also he has some health conditions um, that uh, cause him to be in a little bit of pain, so let's, let's, let's keep Pastor Mark in prayer. Um, and, and, and that God would bless him and give him traveling mercies back and forth from New Mexico. So that's, that's where he's at. Um, many of you have asked you know, where he's at, what he's doing. That's, that's, that's what he's doing. So, amen, amen. Um, if you would, turn in your songbooks to page 39. Uh, this little light of mine, one of my favorite songs. Yeah, does anybody need a songbook? Can you pass uh, a song? Did you need one, sister? No? Okay, we all know this song. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bush. No, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bush. No, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bush. No, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I don't care. I'm going to sing that song. I like it. If it's a kid's song or not, I'm going to sing it. I'm going to enjoy it. Amen, amen. Um, you know, there's, there's something about worship that's important to God. There's something about... Uh, there's something about acknowledging that He helps you and He keeps you and He protects you and He loves you. There's something about getting down on bended knee and telling God thank you and telling God that I, I, I believe in you. And there are many, many religions that, that, that pray and have meditation and, and it is good for the human soul. It's good for the human mind. It's good for the psyche to be able to find a place where you can steal your heart and your mind and, and talk to your Creator and to, to, to tell Him your deepest desires and secrets. The Bible says, cast your cares upon me because I care for you. And, and I know this with all my heart. There are many people that don't believe in God. That's none of my business. But for me, as a, as a person, as a human being, as an individual, when I get close to God in prayer, I feel Him. I feel this God of creation. I, I feel Him in my bones, in my DNA, deep down inside where, where I can't really put a finger on it. I can't say, well, here He is or there He is. I feel this connection to the life force, the, the giver of life. And when we come together and we worship God, we should, we should practice that. We should meditate on that. As we sing this song, Allow yourself to think about God. Think about what you love about Him and, 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 and how He helps you through. And there are so many people in this day and age that like to say, well, you know, Christianity is just a crutch. It's just a way for you to justify your existence in this life. And I, and I always tell them the same thing. It's not just one crutch, it's two. I'll take that cross down and I'll use it to carry me through this life. Because the truth of the matter is, when I apply the principles of the Word of God, Amen. There's the crutch. <laughs> when I, <laughs> that's, a, that's a object lesson. <laughs> when I when I apply the principles and the philosophies of the Word of God, my life gets better. When I deny them and I do what I do the opposite of what they say, my life gets worse. And so there's something to this ancient wisdom. They had it right. They spent a lot of time on this planet dealing with one another, and they had it right. And they 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 they, they learned early on that you got to you got to learn how to be you got to learn how to be with other people. And so I want to praise God for that. Dear Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. Dear Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. 
I love you, adore you, and I bow down before you. Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. Dear Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. Dear Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. I love you, adore you, I bow down before you. Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. One more time. Dear Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. Dear Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. I love you, adore you, I bow down before you. Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Thank you for your goodness, God. Serving God is beautiful. Serving the King of Kings. I serve Him because I love Him, you see. Serving God is so beautiful to me. Serving God is beautiful. Serving the King of Kings. I serve Him because I love Him, you see. Serving God is so beautiful to me. Serving God, it's beautiful. Serving the King of Kings. I serve Him because I love Him, you see. Serving God, is so beautiful to me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. I'm going to sing one more song and then we'll, we'll move on with the service here. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. I can feel the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. I can feel the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. And surely the presence of our Lord He's in this place. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you for your mercy endureth forever, God. You can always tell when we're missing our family members because the songs don't sound quite right. They're, they're just not like they normally are. Amen. Uh, Randall, can you get our communion tray for me, son? Thank you very much. So now we're at that part of the service where we we share the Lord's Supper and we are commanded to do this so that we remember His sacrifice. 
And I would encourage you throughout this next week to think about what this is all about. To consider the cost that Christ paid so that we could be here, so that we could take of this cup and take of this bread. That we would, that we would constantly allow our mind to think about the Lord and, and, and His great sacrifice for us and His love for us and His desire to keep us and to, to protect us from this world. The Bible says that if you love the way that Christ loved, then you're going to get attacked the way Christ was attacked. And so that is a part of partaking of this cup, is you're saying, I partake in your sacrifice. I partake in your hardships. I partake in the things that you had to go through. I'm willing to be spat upon and disrespected and to not fight my own fight. I'm willing to do things a different way than what I'm used to doing them. I'm, I'm willing to walk a different path than I used to walk so that I might attain the attributes of love. And I promise you this, brothers and sisters, as I implore and as I exhort and as I preach, that if you love others the way that God has loved you, you will gain heaven. Hey, uh, Randall, may I have one of those two, son? Uh, I, I assure you that heaven's gates swing wide for those that love and do not hate. But I've been talking to a friend of mine here lately about these scriptures of Christians who get judged very harshly on that day. And if you look, God leaves no room for redefinition. He says, On the right are the people who give to the poor and feed the homeless. On the right are the ones who take care of each other and their neighbor. They're not always worried about themselves, but they're worried about others too. On the left are those that have no compassion. They have no love. They, they, they have no desire to help the people in their lives. I look at Brother and Sister Martinez, their whole life has been a dedication to their family. Whether it's, whether it's Sister Martinez's family or Brother Martinez's family, they're always helping those that are in their lives. I, I look around this room and I see many of us who, we don't have much, but what little we have, we'll give. And that is what heaven is all about. That's what this means. Jesus was a very poor man, considering His stature, who He really was, God in the flesh. And so all he had to give, all he had in his, in his pockets, all, all of his possessions, all of his belongings, all he had was his own life. And he sacrificed that. That's all he came to give. And he was dying so that we might remember him. Dear Lord in Christ, I pray that you bless us this day as we take communion, that you would instruct us in your ways, that you would write them upon our hearts, Lord God Almighty. Give us your spirit. Give us your will. Give us your... Your, your love towards the world, Lord God. I pray that You bless this bread and, and this body, that You bless this cup, this blood, that You'd help us, Lord, to ever remember You and to think about You and to allow Your name to be upon our lips and, and Your ways to be upon our heart, Lord. Be a light to our path. Be a lamp to our feet, Lord, and guide us and direct us in Your holy and wonderful name. Please partake of the bread. And now also the cup. Drink ye all of it. Daniel, can you collect these for me, son? Yeah. How confusing it must have been when Jesus instituted this that last night with His disciples. And they're eating this Passover supper. And He says, Here is My body. Here is My blood. What a strange thing to say. And yet, 2,000 and some years later, we are holding that tradition and keeping that tradition. And so I'm honored to do that today. So we're going to do a little Bible study today. I'm going to ask the kids to, uh, is it, it, are we going to do this in your room? To go in my son's room, you're going to watch a, a movie or something. Try and keep it down. Go on, go on, ladies. Try and keep it down. Uh, don't get in trouble. And uh, we're going to... We're going to talk about a serious subject today. It's one that you guys, most of you guys already know about. Um, and I've spoke at length about it. But I want to do like the Apostle Paul said. He said, I'm going to talk about these things over and over and over and over. Because I want, I want you to have them down in your heart. And I want you to understand them. And, and, and I want you to, to carry them on from here to other people. 
And so today I want to talk about, uh, do a little Bible study on this thought, on this subject, that we would stop paying tithes. That we would stop paying tithes. Now I know each and every one of you here don't do that. You give what money you have to the poor, to your family, and that is what I appreciate. Um, but it's a good Bible study, and for those that are on the internet that, that may not have heard this before, today's your day. Amen. And so, uh, if you'd like, you can get up and get you some snacks that are in the, on, the, on the kitchen table. Um, but my biggest, my biggest concern for the church today is that we are trying to mix the Old Testament and the New Testament. And in doing that, we lose both. We fail both. We fall short of both. And there's one, there's one institution that is goes across almost every single religion and faith in Christianity. There's something like 160,000 different types of Christianity. And there's one institution that you find in each and every one of them, and that is tithe. And so where do we get, where do we get tithes? In the Old Testament, the Bible says, And blessed be the Most High God, delivered thine enemies into thine hand, and he gave them tithes of all. This was Abraham paying tithes to Melchizedek. And so... Tithes meaning one-tenth or ten percent. So Moses took this institution, and God took this institution, and they wrote it into the laws of Leviticus, which is, which is the do's and don'ts of the Old Testament. And we find in Leviticus uh, 27 and 30, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Also in Leviticus... It says, and concerning the tithe of the herd and or of the flock, or whatsoever path passeth underneath the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. So we see that God says, I want tithes of your fields and I want tithes of your flock. Uh, in Numbers, he's talking about what this tithes is for, where it goes, what it does. Uh, Thus speak unto the Levites and say unto them, When you take of the children of Israel the tithes which I have given you from them for an inheritance, then you shall offer up and heave offering unto the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. So tithes was instituted in the Old Testament to, to make sure that the Levites could get paid or to, to live. They didn't actually have money back then. They, they, they did it through food. And the reason why is when God brings the children of Israel out of Egypt, He brings them into the new promised land, um, they take over the promised land and he cuts, he divides the promised land up into 11 different areas for the, for, the, for the 11 different tribes of Israel. Well, the Levites weren't in on that. They were the 12th tribe. The, the Levites' job wasn't to have their own land. It wasn't to, to work as a, as a shepherd. It wasn't to work as a farmer. The Levites' job was basically to handle the offerings of God. Um, just a side note here, the Levites never prophesied. That was up to the prophets. Uh, the Levites' sole job was to take your offering that you sinned and now you gotta, you got to make it right. You bring your offering to them. They cut it open. They let the blood out. And they take a 10% portion of that for their service to the Lord. This was their inheritance. They didn't get land. They didn't get a parcel of land. The Levites got to, to have a city of refuge in each one of these parcels. And so it was, it was the way that God made sure that the Levites could do their job and be able to eat and not have to worry about farming every day. All they did all day long was let blood. And one of the scriptures, the Bible says that around the altar was so bloody that it was muddy with blood. It was soggy with blood. There was so much offering taking place. So many animals are being sacrificed that, that the ground is actually becoming bloody with it. And so, so quite literally, they were the butchers of their day for the Lord. They, they, they would butcher animals. And they, there were certain pieces that had to go certain ways. It was all described in the Levitical priesthood. And, and so this is what tithes in the Old Testament was for. This was what it was for. So right before the New Testament, about 300 years before Jesus comes on the scene, a prophet is born named Malachi. And Malachi, uh, the Bible says, was the last prophet. The last, the, the last prophet in which 
God would speak to His people before Jesus comes back. And this is what Malachi had to say. He said, Even from the days of your fathers you are gone away from Mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto Me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you said, Wherein shall we return? How is it that we've gotten away from you, God? And, God, and, and the prophet says, Well, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed Me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and in offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. So bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there might be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open to you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And so many, 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 many of my contemporaries, almost for 2,000 years now, right after the apostles passed away, they went to Malachi and they say, look, if you want a blessing, you've got to pay tithes, like Malachi said. You have to return to God. In fact, you're sinning if you don't take 10% of what you make and give it to God. If you don't take 10%, if you don't take one-tenth of everything you make and give it to God, give it to the house of God, give it to the priesthood, preacher, then God is going to curse you. Nothing's going to go right in your life. You're going to get sick. You're not going to be able to make money. Everything bad in your life is going to happen if you don't pay your tithes. But if you pay your tithes, God's going to make it right. God's going to take care of everything for you. Nothing bad's going to happen to you. And, and, and you just stay current with your tithes and God's going to give you prosperity. Uh, and I believe that if it wasn't for the New Testament, I would still be preaching that. If it wasn't for the New Testament, then I would be preaching tithes just as fiercely as anybody else. If it wasn't for the New Testament, you'd have to pay tithes. Yeah, if it wasn't for the New Testament, we would still have to pay. The problem with this doctrine is, and it kind of makes me mad, is we eat pork. We work on Saturday. Uh, there's lots and lots of laws. It's about 613 laws, rules and regulations. Some very strange, like you cannot put tomatoes and lettuce in the same garden. That's an abomination, the Bible says. Uh, there, there are laws of cleanliness that none of us keep. None of us, not in this day and age at all. If we kept the laws of Moses, every one of us would have a little house in the back for our wives. For when she becomes unclean, she'd have to go back there once a month for a week. It, it, it's completely absurd that we choose to take the one law that has to do with money. Out of 613 laws, we take one law out and we go, oh, no, no, no. That's the one we're going to keep. That's how we're going to build our churches, pay our ministry. That We're going to use, we're going to use this one law out of the Old Testament to, to try and take care of the poor. We're going to do all these things. We're going to build everything that the New Testament stands on on the law of tithes. And this is just very disconcerting to me. It doesn't make any sense to me. And here's why. Here's why I want you to stop paying tithes. Jesus comes to us, begins to do miracles, and He gives prophecies, and He gives uh, parables, He gives proverbs, He gives us all these wonderful wise, wise sayings and these riddles about the kingdom of God. And then He says in Matthew chapter 5, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. The law or the prophets. Okay, the law is the Ten Commandments and the Levit Levitical Priesthood, those 613 rules. And the prophets are the men that told us to keep those laws. So the law and the prophets. I have not come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but I have come to fulfill, fulfill. To complete. Bring it all about. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, until all be fulfilled. Now this is, you know what, brother? I'll take your questions and comments here in a little bit. Okay. But I want to get. To, there's a lot of scripture I want to. I want to bowl through here. If you look at this, a lot of people try and use this and say, "Well, see, uh, the law and the prophets is still valid." That's not what the Lord is saying. The Lord says, "When all is fulfilled, every jot and every tittle will pass away. Amen. It will pass away." This is what He says, and He fulfilled it. He fulfills it. Not one jot or one tittle shall pass away until all is fulfilled. If you look at that logically, whenever this fulfilling happens, 
whenever this thing happens, this fulfillment, whatever that means, when that happens, every single jot, every single tittle, every scribble, every crossing of the T, every dotting of the I, from the law and the prophet, passes away. Wake up. It dies. It dies. That's what it means to pass away. It dies. Again, Jesus is very like saying to you, this generation, the one He's talking to, way back 2,000 years ago, this generation shall not die, shall not pass away, until all of these things be fulfilled. So He's letting them know, the fulfilling is going to happen this generation, this decade, this time. This is the time of fulfillment. And we know on the cross, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, the gall, He said, it is is finished. Amen. And he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. It is finished. It's complete. It's fulfilled. It's done. Every prophecy in the Old Testament that we read leads up to this cross experience. Every song, every proverb, every parable, every prophecy, every Levitical law is a type and a shadow of Jesus Christ. The laws of cleanliness represent Jesus Christ living a holy and overcoming life without sin, without blemish. The, the laws of sacrifice for sin and the, the Passover lamb in which the children of Israel huddled in their houses eating this lamb, putting the blood on the doorpost and on the lintel is a type and shadow of Jesus Christ hanging on the cross, shedding His blood. The, the Bible says that if all of the children of Israel sin then all of the tribes, all of the leaders of the tribes of the children of Israel have to come and they have to put their hand upon the head of one young bull and then they cut its throat and kill it, which is them saying, let His blood be upon us and our children. So everything about the, the Old Testament is fulfilled in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know this because when Jesus died, the Bible says that holiest of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was hidden, the power of the Old Testament, what's inside the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments. The, bod, the, the, bud that, that, the, the, the rod that budded and a, a little pot of manna from heaven. The Bible says that the veil is rent in two. I believe that's when the Holy Ghost left the Ark of the Covenant and began to seek out the hearts of men. And so I believe that this fulfillment is Christ's death, is Christ's resurrection. But Jesus has a lot of strange things in the New Testament, in the Gospels. He has a lot of, uh, he has a lot of, uh, I don't want to say double talk, but there's a lot of times where he, he tells people to keep the law. He tells people to hold on to the law. Number one, the law is not fulfilled until Jesus dies. So if he would have told somebody to break the law during his life, he would have been stoned right then. They would have had to. That's the law. The law is if you tell someone not to keep the Sabbath, then they get stoned to death. And so God had a purpose. He had a place He was going. He was going to Calvary. The Bible says, How be it? <clears throat> we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to nothing. He says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even that hidden wisdom which God has ordained before the world unto our glory. So God has some wisdom, some, some mystery, some secret that He put forth before the world was formed. For our glory. For our glory. Which none of the princes of this world had knew, for if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they knew what God was up to, if they knew what God was trying to do, if they knew what God was trying to accomplish, I assure you, they would have never crucified Jesus Christ. They would have never allowed this thing to happen. The Bible says this hidden mystery, this wonderful thing, this thing that has been hidden from us all throughout the ages is this. Jeremiah 31 and 31 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according, not, not anything like the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I had taken them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. I'm going to stop right there and say this. A lot of people say that, yeah, the law is passed, the law of cleanliness, the law of pork, the law of this, the law of that. But the Ten Commandments are still valid and you have to keep the Sabbath. You have to keep the Ten Commandments. The problem is, 
the ordinance, the law, the covenant that God made with the children of Israel when He brought them out of Egypt was the Ten Commandments. They come out of Egypt and Moses goes up on Sinai, he brings down two tablets with the Ten Commandments. He says, I'm going to make a new covenant that has nothing to do with the Ten Commandments. It's not like the Ten Commandments at all. He says, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was a good husband to them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This goes on to say that he's going to also give this new covenant to the remnant of the earth. To the Gentiles too. Not just to the Jews but also to those of us that are non-Jewish. So this is the mystery. But what was He hiding? Why, was, why, why didn't Christ just come out and say during the Gospels, I'm God. I'm Jehovah in the flesh. I am fulfilling the Old Testament. Because if they had known that, the Bible says they wouldn't have crucified Him. They wouldn't have killed Him. They didn't want this thing to happen. Why? Hebrews chapter 9 explains this to us. And for this cause... Christ is the mediator of the New Testament. He's the lawyer of the New Testament. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under that first testament, that first Old Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity has to be the death of the testator. For the testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator lives. What this means is when you have a last will and testament, you want to give somebody $500 when you die. You just worked it out that way. Uh, if they come and knock on your door before you die and say, hey, give me that 500 bucks," that doesn't work that way. We know it doesn't work that way. You can't, you can't go to somebody before they die and say, hey, I need that insurance money. I'm a little short. And uh, I need to kind of make up my ends here. I need to make things work. And so we believe at this church that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, knowing that God wrote the Old Testament, knowing that Jesus Christ Himself said, uh, when you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. So much scriptural wealth proves to us, old and new, that Jesus Christ, in fact, is God in the flesh. Therefore, if God wrote the Old Testament through His prophets, through His men, that Old Testament is a will. And He had an insurance policy called redemption. And if God died, if God died, then that old contract is done. What do I mean by that? Let's say you do pass away. Let's say this person does receive their $500 inheritance. And they spend it. They can't come back to your family and say, Hey, I'd like to get that inheritance again. That'd be kind of nice. I need another 500 bucks, so cough it up. It's in the will. Here's the will. It says 500. They go, well, we already gave you the 500. We already gave you the money. They go, no, 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 it doesn't matter. It's, it's in paper. It's, it's, it's a contract. And that's what they're trying to do to you with tithes. You see, tithes was a purpose. There was a reason for it, a good reason for it, and it worked for a long time. It worked longer than we've been working as Christians. They, they had the Old Testament for about 4,000 years. We've had our Testament for about two. So they, they, it, was a, it was a very successful campaign, a very successful institution, but it was specific. And it's been fulfilled. It's been completed. It's done with. And for them to come back to you and say, hey, there's a contract in Malachi that says you owe God money, so cough it up. That's just like someone coming to your family saying that they owe you that, that you owe them money after that person has died. It's not fair. It's grievous. It hurts God's feelings. And I can prove that. The apostles and the disciples spent three years each with Jesus, learning these things, understanding these things. But more importantly, after he died and was resurrected. He came back to them for about 40 days and talked to them, conversed with them, let, let them check out his mortal body that had holes in it. He still ate and drank. And he, 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 he opened up the Scriptures. He breathed on them, the Bible says. And then he said something very strange. The Bible says, Then opened he 
their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures, that they're going to get it, that these men will get it. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to say this, and I believe it with all my heart. Nobody else can say that about what they know about the Bible. No one can say that, hey, God physically opened my understanding to the Scriptures. But the guys that wrote the New Testament can. They can say that God Himself gave me a special understanding of the Bible, the Old Testament. They gave me a, he, God gave me a special understanding of that contract, of that fulfilled word, that last will and testament. And so these men begin to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, teaching the Jews to not follow the law, starting churches, and then they would move on. The Apostle Paul was notorious for this. He would build a church and then move on, build a church and move on. And every time he did this, he would write a letter, send it back to Jerusalem, and they would send one of their preachers to go take this church. And the Bible says that these were Pharisees that believed in Jesus. And when these Pharisees took pastorship over these churches, they took these churches right back to the Old Testament. They said, you've got to get circumcised. You've got to pay tithes. You've got you to do all these things in the Old Testament. We, we're going to follow that book because they're Pharisees. That's what they do. So when Paul would come back down to check on his churches, to see how things are going, to see what God is doing in these churches, the Bible says Paul flipped out. He lost his mind. He was angry. He could not believe that he would build this church on grace, on not works, but on knowing that God did the works already, and now they're going to go back to the Old Testament. They're going to go back to that last will and testament and try and get inheritance out of it. And so we come to this book of Acts, chapter 15, which might be one of the most important verses in the entire Scripture. Because it's the first time that the apostles get in an argument. It's the first time that they're going to debate about doctrine. It's the first time that they're going to have a conflict. It's the first time that they're not liking what people are doing. And the great thing about this, this concession that they come up with is that they come up with a solution. They fix it. They fix their problem. They argue it out. They deal with one another. And then they come up with a solution. So I'm going to skip through Acts 15. And I implore all of you to read Acts 15, understand it, know it, and put it down in your heart. And certain men which came down from Judea, which is right above Jerusalem, taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you can't be saved. So a lot of people say, well, Acts 15 is all about circumcision. Anytime you see the word circumcision in the book, you can write it down that the apostles are also talking about all the laws of Moses. But, it goes on to say, there rose up a certain of the sect of Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise the Gentiles and to command them to keep the laws of Moses. And to command them to keep the laws of Moses. And so we find out that that's what they wanted to do. They were telling you, telling me, they wanted to set up a church that was about Moses' laws. But Peter stands up and he says, Now why for? Why do you want to tempt God to put a yoke about the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were even able to bear? He says, We couldn't even keep the law. And now you want to yoke the New Testament believers with this stuff too. You want to make them bear this burden too. He says, But we believe that through grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that we shall be saved even as, as the Gentiles will be saved. Again, at the end, it goes on and says, For as much as we have heard that certain men which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. That's Acts 15, verse 24. He says, When they teach you the law, when they teach you circumcision, when they teach you Sabbath, when they teach you about tithes, they're troubling you, they're subverting you, and they're causing you to fall away from God, and they had no commandment to do that. No one told them they were allowed to do that. Not one of us told them that that was okay. Later on in the book, in this same chapter, it goes on and talks about the four necessary things. And we find out that they wrote a letter saying this stuff, saying stop following the law, saying stop listening to these men, saying get away from them, saying put them away from you. And they sent this letter, this epistle out to all the different churches. One of the first churches to receive this letter is the Galatians. 
And the Galatians said, no. We're going to follow this preacher you sent us. We love him. We're going to pay his tithes. We're going to take care of him. We're going to continue to make people be circumcised. We're going to continue to follow the laws of Moses. And so Paul sets himself in motion to write a very special letter to the Galatians. So if you read the book of Galatians, read Acts chapter 15 first, then read the book of Galatians. What you're going to find out is that they disobeyed this letter. And Paul brings them back in the line. How does he bring them back in the line? He says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. He says, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which, you have, than that, that which we have already preached unto you, let that person be accursed. Don't even talk to them, that means. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have already received, let him be accursed. The book of Galatians is dripping, absolutely dripping, with anti-law rhetoric. The Apostle Paul goes through and through and through it over and over. He looks, at, he looks at the law every way he can in the book of Galatians. He tries to explain it every, every which way that he can to get them to stop following this guy. To get them to realize that the law is poison to grace. There's a scripture in the Bible that says a little leaven, leaven is the whole lump. I was taught my whole life that meant sin. Come to find out, you read it in an uncherry picked fashion. It's talking about the law. Why? Could you imagine, if you will, that the only way that you can get your kids to live a prosperous life is if you take out an insurance policy and you die. So you do it. You give all your money to this insurance policy. You put everything you've got into this last will, this last testament. And then you finally succumb and you die. And that, and that money is paid out. It's paid out. They are given everything. They're given everything. And then, after they spend it all, they go back to that list, last will and testament and try and make something of it. You know what that means? It means you died for nothing. It was worthless. Everything your life was about, everything your life was for, was trying to protect your kids, and they just blow it and throw it in your face. And that's what the apostles seen with going back to the Mosaic Law. That's what the apostles seen when, when they seen us trying to have grace and the Old Testament. What we were saying is God is just not good enough. I mean, I know you died and everything, and that's really cool, and I kind of like that about you. It makes me feel close to you. But I want Moses' laws too. I want to do what he wanted me to do, not what you wanted me to do. And that breaks God's heart. It changes the, the dynamic in which He can give us grace. He goes on to say in Galatians, We know that a man is not justified by the works of the law. We know this. But by faith of Jesus Christ, that's how we're justified. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no man be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we, also are, we, we ourselves are also found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. He says, no. He says, no, we're not going to sin and then go, hey, God, forgive me and sin. Hey, God, forgive me and sin. He says, no, you've got to try and be right. And then he goes on and he says something very particular. He says, For if I build again the things that I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. I make myself a sinner. I make myself fall short. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I that lives, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Christ, what he's saying is trying to serve the law and have grace is sinful. Paul was a lawyer. He was a Pharisee. He was, he was on his way. He was fast-tracking to become the high priest underneath the house of Gamaliel, who was the same high priest who crucified Christ. 
And Paul says, he says, I did away with that. I tore that down. He says, if I build that back up again, I make myself a transgressor. Here's the thing. When we, when we cut someone down, and we hurt them, or we steal from them, or, or, or we commit adultery with their spouse, or we do these terrible things, we're sinning against them, and it's terrible, and God's going to judge us for that. Amen? But when we say, I want grace and Moses, we sin against the cross. When we say, hey, I want to get blessed through tithes because Moses and Malachi told me that, we sin against the cross. And that's what Paul's putting down. And that's why I'm so, that's why I'm always so on this thing. Because the law tears the cross down, makes it unnecessary. It makes God, Jehovah's God, sacrifice vanity, worthless, without effect. And I can tell you right now, there's not much more that I could say would be blasphemous than to say God died for nothing. It was worthless. I wished He hadn't done it. I would prefer to get blessed by Moses. Again, Paul says to the Galatians, chapter 5, Stand fast, therefore, in that liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He's talking about what Peter said. That, that, that even, why would you want to put a yoke of bondage on the children, the, the, the Gentiles? Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. If you get circumcised or you keep any of the laws, you pay tithes, you keep the Sabbath, and you're doing that for righteousness sake, Christ can't profit you. What, what he's saying is, if you're paying your tithes to get a blessing, God can't bless you. If you put your money in the offering box, expecting to get prospered, expecting to get blessed, expecting something to jump right back out of that box and right into your pocket, he's saying the very act of doing that keeps God from allowing to bless you. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised or keep any of the laws, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is now a debtor to do all of the law. This is a very vital point I want to make here today. And I know this is going on. Please bear with your preacher. Like I said, I was up all night, so I'm tired too. <laughs> but I want to get through this because I want to put this in your heart. He says that if, say, you get circumcised. Boy, my back is giving me fits here. He says if you get circumcised because you're keeping the law, he says, now you have to keep all the law. No. 613 rules and regulations. If you get circumcised to be justified, and there are many of us, today it's common practice, it's medical practice to circumcise a young boy. In fact, if you don't want your kids circumcised, you have to tell them don't. Before you used to have to tell them to do that. Now you have to tell although Judaic, I'm gonna, I'm, I want to clear this up since we're talking about this. Judaic circumcision is much different than what they do at the hospital when your baby is, what, a couple days old, a couple hours old, whatever. Totally different. Um, but nevertheless, Paul says, if you get circumcised, you have to keep all the law. I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, if you pay tithes, if you go... Now, I'm going to tell on my sister because she's just got the faith of an angel. My sister pays tithes but not 10%, as you suppose. She pays tithes of the heart. She gives of her heart. And I remember, sister, when you came to us and you said, look, I, I'm trying to help my... I'm going to change my chair. Man. My legs are falling asleep. Um, she came to us and said, look, my daughter really needs my help. And I'm, I, I, I really need to help her out. And so I, I'm, I, 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 I need to figure out if I can give her this money. And I, and I told her, don't put the money in our offering box. You put it in God's offering box. You help her out. And she help, she helps her out. My goal for you, brothers and sisters, I'm going to get off track here a little bit. My goal for you is not to pay tithes and not to put money into this. We can have a church without money. We're proving that right now. And I know it's not as grand and glorious as many of the other churches here in town, but I don't care about that. It's not the packaging, it's the product. Right? It's not the packaging, it's the product. And the product is this. Go give to the poor. And bless them and help them. That is the message of Christ. But what my brothers and sisters have done in this current day and age is resurrected Moses. 
resurrected Malachi and brought back the institution of tithes against us because the Bible says that if you keep tithes, you have to stop eating pork. If you're paying your tithes to get blessed, you need to get circumcised the way the Jews did. And that's painful. It ain't pretty. People die from it all the time. Die from They bleed out. He says, look, if you, if you, if you get circumcised, you, gotta, you're, you are now indebted to God to keep the whole law. He says, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. All across town today, my brothers, and I love them, I do, are telling my other brothers and sisters they have to pay tithes. And in, in effect, what they're doing is making them fall from grace. They're subverting their souls. They're troubling them, and they have no commandment to do so. No scriptural commandment. We're going to get there. We're, we're going to, we got somewhere to go here. Romans says it a different way. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he lives. You know that, right? And he's like, yes, sir, we do. For the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. Amen? Till death do his part. Sisters, just going to have to put up with that dude. <laughs> he says... For the woman which has a husband is bound to law as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Also true. If I die, my wife, and I expect her to do this if I die, I expect her to remarry. Find someone to provide for the kids. Find someone that makes her happy. So then, if while her husband lives, if while her husband's alive, she's married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, she is now, she, that, uh, so that she is now no adulteress, though she is married to another man. So this is a great principle. And he builds on that principle. He says this, Wherefore, the reason why I said that is this, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. He says, that old man was hurtful, and he beat you, and he demanded things of you. And if you tripped up, and you didn't do right, he'd stone you to death. He says, that old man, that old law was harsh and rough on you. But he died that day. He died. And he said, you're done grieving. Your year of bereavement is over. Take off the black, put on the white, and be married to Christ. It's crucial to me to tell you this today. We've got to stop resurrecting Moses. We've got to stop resurrecting Malachi. And we've got to allow our Messiah to be resurrected and be married unto Him and Him alone. And I can tell you what, it would be a strange thing indeed for you to be married to a new husband who you love, who takes care of you, who gives to you graciously, who never hurts you, who never harms you, and for you to go back to that old grave and try to marry that guy on the ground. And that's what we're doing when we go back to the Old Testament. It's a perversion, the Bible says. It's a sickness. It is leaven. It changes the way we act. And the reason why I'm so hot on this trail is there's a scripture that says, those of you that keep the law become judges of the law. And if we judge, we go to hell. If we judge, we get judged. So there's a, there's a reason for my fervency. Again, we find this written in another way, which is important. It's important to see that the apostles were attacking this at every, at every angle that they could. They were trying desperately to tell the Jews, let it go, let it go, let it go. You're saved by grace. You can't do right. Oh my gosh, I just heard I was selling jerky the other day. And someone told me that the reason why people don't come to church, the reason why sinners don't repent, the reason why people don't become believers is because they see Christians not being righteous enough. We're not being righteous enough apparently and that's why homosexuals aren't converting. We're not being godly enough, and that's why drug addicts don't convert. I'm going to tell you something. They're kind of right in that. They're kind of right. Because judgment is a sin. It's a sin. 
It's scriptural. It's sinful to judge. And so when non-believers see us judging, of course they don't want to come nowhere near us. Our righteousness is as a filthy rags. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how brightly you shine. It's not good enough. What is good enough is when God says, you're good enough. When God says, I've already done the work. You just got to accept it. And by going back to tithes, and believe me, for the seventh day of Venice, I talk about the Sabbath. For the Jehovah's Witness, I talk about birthdays. Like whatever law that they're using, I, 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 I attack that. I go after that. But for the, for, for, for the Protestant church, for the Christian church, tithes is a thorn that must be removed. All right. So we've established where the law comes from. We've established how the prophets or the apostles believed that tithes should, should go away, that all the laws should go away. So why do we still have it? Like it's here. And here's the funny thing, right? Is every church in town that's teaching tithes at the front end of the service, halfway through the service is going to tell you to go have some pork at the barbecue place. Hey, uh, thank all the brothers for coming down on Saturday and working around the church. We appreciate you working on the Sabbath. Now pay your tithes. Right? How is it that they, in one instance, they're telling us we have to follow this Malachi law. Why do they do that? And then on the other instance, they know, and we all know this. It blows my mind. We all know that the law is gone and we don't keep the law. Right? I mean, every church you go to, uh, my old church had all kinds of laws they, they believed in, but if you would pull one out that they didn't like, it, go, oh, no, 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 the law is fulfilled. Right? Like, well, not, like, well, you just told my wife she has to wear skirts, she can't wear pants, because what it says in Deuteronomy, I can't have facial hair, because what it says in Leviticus, I can't have tattoos, because what it says in... But you don't like that law, right? It's a buffet. Well, why is it a buffet? Why is tithes always served on this buffet? Here's, here's one of the reasons, okay? Matthew 20 through 23, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. He's mad at them. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and incense and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you have to you these ye ought to do, and not leave the other undone, and not leave the tithes undone. So they say, look, Jesus is in the New Testament. And he said, don't leave the tithes undone. Therefore, we have to pay tithes. And then we start bringing out Malachi and all this. Well, the problem with this is twofold. Number one, when Jesus said this, he was not in the New Testament. You see, the New Testament does not start at Matthew. That's ridiculous. The New Testament starts at the cross. It starts at Calvary. It starts the moment that Jesus started to bleed great drops of blood through his skin. The New Testament begins when Jesus Christ starts to get whipped 30, 40 save one. The, the, the New Testament starts when you can hear the sound of the ring of the hammer hitting the nails on that old cross. That's the New Testament. The New Testament is when the Bible says something crazy happens. The, 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 the sun goes black. The moon goes red as, 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 as blood. And the, 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 the graves give up the dead and they show themselves all over, all over the city. And the Roman says, surely this is the Son of God. The New Testament starts when they stab Jesus in the side and water and blood. That's the, New, the New Testament did not start when Jesus was born. It started when Jesus died. Amen. And therefore, all throughout Jesus' ministry, He was very careful to tiptoe through the tulips and not say anything too extreme. Otherwise, they'd have stoned Him right then. So, number one, the problem with this Scripture is Jesus keep tithes. So you had to tell them to keep Sabbath. It's like you had to tell them all the other things. But when you read this, when I read this, what this tells me is that Jesus is telling us here in Matthew 23, 23, is that tithe is the law. He says you pay tithes, mint and incense, but you omit the weightier matters of the law. So even Jesus Christ Himself tells us that tithes is of the law. And what did he say about the law and the prophets? That it will pass away. It will pass away. So if Jesus says tithes is the law, and then he says that the law will be fulfilled, then I'm telling you, the law of tithes is fulfilled. Again, we see something 
uh, very strange uh, in, in, in the church. Um, the apostle, I, I hear it all the time. There's no good scripture in the New Testament that says the tithes is the law. There's no good scripture in the New Testament that says the tithes is in the law. That's not true. Hebrews 7 and 5 says, And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who have received the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law. That's Hebrews 7 and 5. That the Levites take tithes of the people according to the law. It's in the book. Tithes is of the law. Tithes is the law. In that same chapter, Hebrews 7, verse 12, the apostle goes on and says, For the priesthood was changed. We don't know the Levitical priesthood. How many of you sacrificed a goat today for your sins? None. It's because we don't follow the, Le 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 the Levitical law. He says, For the priesthood's being changed, there is made a necessity a change also of the law. He says, We've got to change this law of tithes too. The Levites are gone. The inheritance is gone. The need to keep them above water is gone. And the last reason why we continue to preach tithes in the church is this grandfathering in. Um, if, you had, if you had an assault rifle prior to 1980, uh, President Ronald Reagan um, and his group banned assault rifles. I don't know if you knew that or not for about 12 years or so. If you had an assault rifle prior to that law, you got to keep it. You were grandfathered in. Right? My uh, my bishop actually had a street sweeper shotgun. I don't know if you, any of you know what that is. It's a semi-automatic 12-gauge shotgun with a with a barrel on it, a large barrel like a revolver, and it could shoot something like 24 rounds out of that thing, and you could literally go clean the street of people. He had this, he loved his gun, and the reason why he was allowed to keep it, because now they're illegal, is he had it before the law. It was grandfathered in. Uh, if any of you have an old car that doesn't have seat belts, didn't come from the manufacturer with seat belts, we know that all cars must have seat belts. If you ha own that car, you are grandfathered in. You can't get a ticket for not wearing a seat belt can't happen, right? So what they're saying is, no, 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 you're right, preacher, you're right, the, 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 the law is done, Christ fulfilled it, grace is ours, amen, but tithes has been grandfathered in. Because Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek before the law. And therefore, law of tithes is grandfathered in, and now we have to keep that law because we're the children of Abraham. This is just not true because Abraham also gave the first blood sacrifice. Turtle dove, bullock, the correct animals, before the law. He was also the first one to be circumcised, also before the law. And yet out of these three rules, we pick money. And not we, the people who run the church, who make the rules, who, who set the guidelines for the church have picked the one law that gets them paid. The one law that allows them to take your money, build huge churches so that they can put more people in the seats. And what, what does a seat hold? It doesn't really seat a soul. It seats a wallet and a purse. And I know that's a very terrible way to look at it, but how else am I to look at it when all they talk about is money? <clears throat> So back to that concept about circumcision, keeping the whole law. Galatians 3 and 10 says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Remember the curse of Malachi? He says, man, God's going to curse you. You don't pay your tithes. Come back to God. Pay your offering. Pay your tithes. For as many as are of the works of the law, those that are doing the law right now, paying tithes, keeping the Sabbath, uh, some don't eat pork, blah, blah, blah. For as many of you that are of the works of the law, are under the curse right now. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You keep one, you don't do the rest, you're going to be cursed by them. But that no man is justified by the law anymore in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. That's what they want for us. And the law is not of faith. Wow. Wow. Another scripture says that anything is not of faith is sin. It's sin. And the law is not of faith. But the man that do them, that, that doeth them shall live in them. 
If you're going to do them, you've got to do them all. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of Malachi. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of Moses. Christ has redeemed us from every curse of the law, being made a curse for us because it was written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree. So he says, you're going to keep one law, you've got to keep them all, or you will be cursed. And I'm, I have a place to go with this specific idea that if, if you keep tithes and you eat pork, you're going to be cursed for that tithes and that pork. Again, James tells us, for, so, so, for whosoever tries to keep the whole law and yet offends in one point, he is now guilty of all. So this is an even stranger thing. If you're able to keep all the law, but you break one point, all the law that you kept is now broken. Okay, where am I going with this? If, and this is my last page, I promise. <laughs> if you pay tithes and you eat pork, you're telling God, I want the curses and blessings of the Old Testament. Amen? I don't want Calvary. I don't want the cross. It's not good enough. Give me Moses. And I'm going to tell you what happened to me. I did that. I listened to my preacher. I paid my tithes. I paid more tithes than I probably should have. I paid my 5% offering, which is kind of a joke, but I did it anyway. And my life was falling apart. Year after year after year, it was getting worse and worse and worse and worse. They're trying to come take the house away. I would not pay my house payment. I would pay my tithes. Could you read more? Amen. The problem is, I wasn't keeping all the law. I was trying to get blessed off of tithes. I was trying to get, get perfection out of tithes. I was trying to be justified by tithes, but I left all the other laws alone, and therefore the tithe that I had was now being, un, it was being undone. It was being broken. The tithe that I was keeping was now untithed. So I'm telling God, bless me and I'll pay my tithes. But then I wouldn't keep the other laws, and God says, but your tithe isn't being paid. Well, yeah, I paid 10%. No, 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 you haven't kept all the laws. I was being cursed. I was. That's why this is important to me. Because the truth is, the truth is, all these churches all over here, we are lying about our blessings. We are lying. We are told time and time again that if we pay tithes, we get blessed, and then we get cursed, so what do we do? We go put it on our credit card. Huh? God's supposed to make a car, a brand new car, the way they preach it, fall down out of the sky, and the key's right in your hand. And when that doesn't happen, you run out and you finance that thing. And then you show up to church. You go, praise God, gave me a new car. God didn't give you that car. Credit did. Uncle Sam did. Capitalism did. But then we testify, and you go, oh, that's harsh to say that, preacher. The reason why I'm saying it is because six months down the road, it gets repossessed because it was too much car. You're buried, and you're upside down, and you're still trying to pay tithes to get out of it. They'll tell you. I heard this preached before. I don't like to eat hamburger. That's why I pay tithes, so I can have steak. You want to live in a little house, that's fine. That's between you and Jesus. But I want to live in a mansion. That's why I pay tithes. Well, these preachers ain't paying tithes. And the fact is, like I read in the beginning, if you're a Levite and you receive tithes, you've got to pay a tenth thereof. A tenth upon the tithe, the Bible says. But they don't pay tithes. In fact, here's why it seems to me that the ministry gets blessed and, and the, the pews, the pulpit gets blessed and the pews get cursed. Because the pews are paying tithes to get blessed. And God says, yeah, but you're not keeping the rest of the law, so I can't bless you. In fact, you want to be cursed because you're paying it this way. So He curses us. We lie about it and say, oh, you know, God God didn't give me too much or not too little. That's not a blessing. That's a bailout, okay? That's God bailing you out of the ship you made. But up here on the pulpit, preachers ain't paying tithes. In fact, the only time they give is when there's a, short, a shortage in the church, and then they give from charity. <laughs> and charity is how we get blessed. And so they're getting blessed while the pew is getting cursed. They, are, they have a yoke of bondage around their neck. And then we lie about it to make the preacher feel good about this system that they've created. And it's no good, and it's no fair, and there's no equality in it. And the Apostle Paul said, I will not have all of you burdened and me be eased. He goes, that's ridiculous. Everything in equality, he said. And so, why can't our brothers and sisters see this? Why is it that I went to a church for 13 years and I was pretty sharp with that old book? Everyone knew Brother Scotty. 
They knew that if you had a problem with somebody about the Scriptures, you go to Scott. And he'll take care of it. He'll either give you a Bible study right now on the spot, which I always did. I said, oh, you need that? Okay, well, here we go. Because the Lord's blessed me. That's my gift from God, to know the Scriptures. Read them that. That should help. There's your prescription. Why can't they see it? Why couldn't I see it? These Scriptures have never gone away. They didn't just appear one day. They, I've read them a million times. How did I read past them? Bear with me. We're almost done. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 6. God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, and not of the letter, but of the Spirit. I want, I want to line this out for you. The New Testament wasn't written yet. The New Testament is Christ and His example. So when they speak of the letter, they're speaking of that which is already written, the, the jots and the tittles. Not of the Old Testament letter, but of the Spirit of Christ. For the Old Testament letter kills, but the Spirit of Christ gives life. But, if the ministration of death, written and engraved in on stones... What was written and engraved on stones? Ten Commandments. If the ministration of death, that letter that kills, which was written and engraved on stones, was glorious, if it was glorious so that the children of Israel could not even look at the face of Moses because of his countenance, which glory was going to be done away with. He was going to die. If you remember, Moses shined with a great light after he came down off of Mount Sinai. He had to wear a veil. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be much more glorious? He says, the Old Testament is glorious. He says, I assure you, the New Testament is better. It's better. It's more important. It's more glorious, more radiant. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. Think of the Old Testament as the moon. Oh, it's beautiful. It's glorious. It shines light down on us. We can see pretty good when it's full. But the New Testament is the sun who's so bright you can't even see the Old Testament. And it brings life. The moon cannot nourish plants or animals or people but the sun surely can. And so that is the difference. He's saying, yeah, the moon was glorious last night. It was amazing. But did you see that sunrise? So it was even much more amazing. He says, for if that which is done away was glorious, whoa, wait a minute, Paul, you get a little crazy there. You're telling me the Ten Commandments was done away with? He says, yeah, for that which is done away with is glorious, much more that which, is, which remains is even more glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we decide to use great plainness of speech. We keep it simple. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. So he says, he says that the Old Testament kills. It's the letter of death. It says it's been done away with. And now he says the Old Testament is abolished. He says in verse 14, but their minds, this is the important part, my mind, 13 years, but their minds were blinded, for unto this day remains that same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, brothers and sisters, 2014, even unto this day when Moses is read, that same veil it's still upon their heart. They can't see this. Nevertheless, when it shall turn, their heart shall turn to the Lord, that veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. When we read the New Testament, and we read the Old Testament, and we are partaking in the laws of the Old Testament, there is a veil on our heart you can't see. You're blind. Another scripture says that God blinds us Himself, that we not we will not be able to see unto the end of our salvation. It is crucial and vital to anybody out there, those of your friends and family, those that are watching us on YouTube, it's crucial 
that if you're paying tithes, if you're keeping the laws, put it on hold by faith for a month and talk to God and see if He'll remove that veil. Because these scriptures are valid and they're not going away. If a set of scriptures like this can tear down a 2,000 year institution of tithes, then I'm here to tell you that that institution deserves to be torn down. If a piece of paper with some words on it can disprove everything you believe about tithes, then you need to rethink what you believe about tithes. If the scriptures that you say command you to keep tithes, and they're really saying don't keep tithes, then you've got to do your homework. You've got to allow yourself to let go of tradition and take up truth. And so I'm going to close with this last scripture. Romans 13 and 8 says, they say, wherein have we robbed thee, God? Pompous and arrogant. God says, you robbed me in tithes and offering. Of course, God was talking about an Old Testament system. Today, they posit that same question to us. Wherein have you robbed God, O oh children? In tithes and offering. So pay 10% of your paycheck. Well, I would like to re-ask them that same question. I believe that the preachers, the priests, the prophets, the pastors in this world today are robbing God of tithes and offering. They're robbing Him. They're demanding children pay it. They're demanding that the sheep give what they don't have to give. They're forcing you to feel bad about what you do not have. And they're telling you if you don't do it, you'll be cursed. They're robbing God. Every time they reach into your pocket and take 10% out, they are stealing from the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is charity to the poor. We know every time Christ talks about that judgment seat, He talks about charity and love, and that's it. He ain't never talk about tithes when it comes to heaven. And so this is the last scripture I would like to give to you. Thank you for being patient and kind to, to your preacher. Romans 13 and 8 says about this curse that Christ delivered us from. He says, Oh, no man anything. You don't owe nobody tithes. You don't owe nobody offering. Let me tell you something. Your prosperity, your blessing was paid for in blood. There ain't enough tithes in all this world to earn cross, the cross of Calvary. There ain't enough tithes in all this world to deserve a sacrifice from God. Oh, no man anything but... says This is what you owe. They told me that I'm teaching you wrong because I'm not teaching your obligation in tithes. Let me tell you what your obligation, what your payment is to your Heavenly Father. He says, Oh, no man anything but... you got to owe this to love one another. For he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. Christ said, Are ye not gods? It's an Old Testament scripture. Brother Jeremy showed me that. Are ye not gods? What do I mean by that? Jesus said, Love others as I have loved you. He says, Treat others as I have treated you. Treat them like you treat me. Love them like you love me. He closes the circle. He lets us know that we're not just some peon ants that God's interested in shaking the ant farm every once in a while because we don't pay tithes. We are God. And God is us. And I'm here to tell you today that by loving one another and by helping each other when we are in need, you are fulfilling your obligation. And just like God came down in the flesh, and dwelt a man named Jesus Christ, the first man to have the Holy Ghost. Amen? Was able to fulfill the law, so also you are able to fulfill the law. He fulfilled the law by keeping every law, 613 or some odd, never breaking them, always keeping them, and He fulfilled the law doing it that way. The way that He said you will fulfill the law is by loving each other. So go on as the daughters and as the sons of the first man to have the Spirit of God, as you also have the Spirit of God, which escaped that Old Testament. It escaped that Old Covenant. It escaped that Ark. 
and it is indwelled in your hearts. Now you are the sons and daughters of the man that had the Spirit of God. You have the Spirit of God. You go on now and do His work by fulfilling the law. Amen. Thank you so much for your attention. Is there any questions or comments here today? Anything that anyone would like to add? I probably better unlock that door and let you guys go. <laughs> Amen. I love you all so very much. If the Lord is willing, I'm going to try and preach next Sunday on paid preaching. And the Sunday after that, I'm going to try and preach on spiritual giving. We'll see what the Lord does. You know how crazy we are out the window. But I want to revisit these doctrines. As the Apostle Paul told the, the young Timothy to do, you keep preaching this stuff, even when they're tired of it, you preach it. Preach it, you put it in their heart because we got somewhere we got to go. And that ain't to tithes. It's to heaven. And heaven isn't built on money. It's built on love and forgiveness and mercy. So if you have someone in your life today that you owe an apology to, then you give that to them because you got somewhere to go. And that apology will weigh you down. If somebody's hurt you and condemned you and come and, and just cut you off, they take your words and sharpen them real nice and then stab you in the back with them, if you owe, if you, if you owe forgiveness, call them up. I forgive you. I'm not holding it against you. And I would like to say this, the best way to start into a forgiveness is to ask for forgiveness first. The best forgiveness comes from an apology. So pick up the phone and say, hey, I apologize for hurting you and I forgive you. And you will go to heaven. May God bless you. Thank you for your attention and for your time. God bless you and keep you in Jesus' name. You're dismissed. Amen.